Please give a warm welcome to Frankie. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm the lead developer, platform developer for the Atlantic.com, the eponymous website for 160-year-old politics and culture magazine headquartered in Washington, D.C. Today I'm going to be talking about how to manipulate the internals of C Python so that you can make the interpreter evaluate 2 plus 2 to equal 5. So a bit of background on my topic. Originally what I was trying to do was create a class decorator API that looks something like this. So here you have... Um, a class and then you pass as its parent class a meta class of sorts that tells it it should be patching and then you define the methods and you'd be able to use super to call the original method. It turned out it really wasn't possible or rather it was but it was very inadvisable because it required you to mutate the MRO or method resolution order of the classes in a way that can only be done by accessing the underlying C structs. But in this semi-failed attempt, I became curious about just how far you could push the limits of manipulating C Python internals at runtime with C types. Would it be possible, for instance, to make 2 plus 2 equal 5? Uh, and it also seemed maybe slightly topical um, with recent events. So uh, it was one of those situations where I'd gone down a rabbit hole. Several points, I came very close. And so the tantalizing nature of it kind of drove me forward to eventually uh, achieve it. And also in the process, I learned a lot about how different parts of the Python interpreter work. Uh, and so I'll go over those. I'll sort of structure the talk so that it uh, kind of recapitulates the order that I attempted to solve the problem. And then along the way, explain the different techniques and underlying uh, structures that, that inform it. So prior art and reference, um, there's a library Forbidden Fruit that does something sort of similar. It doesn't go to quite the same extent, um, but it does cover the first technique that I used to try to patch integer addition. And the full code for this presentation is in Python double scripts, which is at that URL there. Um, and it has running unit tests and whatnot. So um, yeah. Uh, so let's say this is test-driven development. We're going to write a test case. Uh, probably a context manager is a good idea because you don't want to set 2 plus 2 to equal 5 across the entire lifespan of the executable. That'll certainly crash something. I mean, I, I don't know how it wouldn't. So do it as a context manager and then assert that 2 plus 2 equals 5. So a naive approach, and it's only naive because it, it doesn't work, but I mean, in any other respect, it would work, um, is you take a reference to the old underscore underscore add method. You define a new method that if A and B are both two, return five, otherwise call the old add method. And then you try and maybe set in underscore underscore add equals in add, you get a type error. Can't set attributes of built-in extension type int. You try and set it on the dict, you get dict proxy object does not support item assignment. So quick um, kind of crash course in C types. Um, C types allows you to load any shared library, but it comes with a convenience attribute for accessing the libpython C library by ways of ctypes.python API. Any C functions that are exposed in the library can be accessed as attributes of ctypes.python API. There are a few quirks with how it handles types. Um, for instance, you set the attributes arg types and res type on the functions so that the C types module knows how to pass arguments, that is, like how to convert, say, a number. Uh, an in object in Python into an actual C int, or whether it should actually be a Python object int. Um, so in this case, we're, we're using pi get version. It returns a pointer to a null terminated care array, so we use C types dot C care p. It also comes with a bunch of built-in types like C care p, which is a pointer to a care, C void p, which is like a pointer to any address, etc. So arg types. Uh, when you specify it, it's a list. Each element corresponds to the type of that positional argument. Um, it also has this very useful type pi object, which lets you pass Python objects into functions and get them back as Python objects instead of as some sort of abstract type that you can't use. Um, alternatively, you could set the res type to C void p, for instance, as another type. That would just give you the address, um, and so you wouldn't be able to do much, but just as an example. So another really powerful feature of C types is the structure type. Um, 
For this talk, the only thing we'll really be concerned with the structure class is the underscore fields underscore attribute. Uh, it's a list of two tuples. The first item is the name of the attribute, and the second item is the type. These provide a way to create Python objects that act like C structs and can be passed as C structs into C functions and otherwise act more or less like normal Python objects. So here I've listed the struct definition for the base Python object, pi object, which is two fields. Um, OB ref count, which is the reference count, and it's a pi size, S size T, which represents the size of a block in memory that can be read or written in a single operation. Though not entirely in Python 3, it defaults to the 64-bit version, even on 32-bit machines, but that's kind of a minor detail. So um, the reference counts defined um, in the C code is pi S size T, so we follow that. And then the next variable in the struct is a pointer to the object's type. Uh, like a quick recap for how structs are like conventionally used in large programming language interpreters. Um, because structs are cont basically contiguous blocks of memory, and it's just a list of objects that say this first number of bits should be used as this type of object, the next set of bits should be used as that type of object. You can use the same, you can have a base type and pass that around, and then as long as the memory is allocated for more things to be added to it, you can upcast it to something more specific. So for instance, you get a pi object, look at the OB type, oh, it's an integer type, and then you call the method to sort of populate the integer, and now you have a full hydrated integer field with a pointer to the number that it represents, for instance. Uh, and so in order to actually be able to use this, we need a way to be able to turn our Python objects into C type structures. Um, the py in C Python, the built-in function ID returns the object's address in memory, so it's very convenient for this purpose because the from address class method on structures takes a, an address in memory and returns a struct for it. Um, a side note, C types has a pointer function that transforms a type into a pointer of that type. Uh, we'll use that later and it'll make more sense in context. Uh, so here I'm getting the reference count of the pi object. You can see in the first case uh, it's seven and in the second case it's eight. The difference is that in sys get ref count there's an extra reference for the argument inside the get ref count function. All right, so now let's try to override int add. Uh, we'll return to our original naive approach of patching integer in addition uh, in the dict. So if we could mutate the add item in the dict, we would be able to achieve our goal now. Um, but since underscore underscore dict underscore underscore isn't a regular dict um, and is some sort of proxy for a dict, um, we need to do something with that. And it turns out that the underlying C struct has a pointer to an ordinary mutable dict. So um, another side note, um, a useful feature of C-type structures is that, like I mentioned about how like pi int object can extend pi object, you can do that with the class inheritance syntax in Python. So here we have class dict proxy, and it, because the struct starts with the pi object attributes, those are the first fields, and then the next field is the dict. When we use that, uh, we can create a function that lets us mutate the class. It uses a little bit of trickery. This is uh, the functionality that I sort of borrowed from the Forbidden Fruit library. You uh, gra populate the dict proxy, then you create a temporary dictionary and you set a key, set an item with a key none and the value that dict and return it. And that the thing you get back is a regular Python dictionary that you can change. So, we make it mutable, we change the double underscore add method, and it doesn't work. I mean, it does in a sense. You can call the underscore underscore add method and you get the desired result, but in every other case, it doesn't. So why doesn't overriding double underscore add suffice? In the C code, um, if you look at the, the function that adds numbers, it's doing something where it's looking at the slot function for the int type. So, um, kind of a quick like look here at um, what a pi type object is and so this is again extends the pi object and has extra attributes one of them is a list of methods if the thing is a number in the case that um, it is a number 
it has a couple of functions. So we have um, number add, number subtract, number multiply, et cetera. For the, uh, the first thing there, the syntax is a little bit odd for defining um, types in C that are functions um, or pointers to functions. The pi object star is the return type, so it's returning a pointer to a pi object. Star binary func is the name of the thing. It's a, it's a binary, binary func is the name and it's a pointer. And then the next parentheses is, are the arguments. So uh, we can set that with C types by using the C func type uh, function, which takes return type and then arg types as a list of arguments. Uh, so we duplicate that there. And uh, we use a structure to represent the pi number struct. So here we have the fields for number add, and we specify as the type, the binary function. All right, so we put it all together. Uh, we define the pi type object, copying over the attributes that we had over here. And um, we populate it with from address id int. And then we try and call number add, and we get what we would expect. Two plus two is four. So um, ignore the top function there. So again, we're going to try and do it as a context manager so we don't blow everything up in the process of testing. Um, we get the, the tricky thing with like the original approach of grabbing the original add function and then using it again is that it wouldn't work if you were to just use nb add, because when you change it, the thing you're then referencing is still a pointer to that changed thing. So you need to get the address of the original function and then create a new binary function that points to that address. So that's what we do here in these first two lines of old nb add address and old nb add. We define our new add function and then um, we replace the function and call the original the same way we did in that sort of naive approach. We get pretty close. Um, if you just do two plus two, that doesn't work, but eval two plus two does. Um, so let's use the dis module to see what's going on. Dis lets you pass it either a code object or a string of code, and it'll give you back uh, diagnostics and information about the tokens that the, the abstract syntax tree that Python uses to represent it. So here we have uh, a global variable, two equals the number two and then a function add two plus two, and then inside return two plus two, and you can see uh, in the, um, how it interprets that is load the global two, load the global two again, add the last two things, and then return the value. So that binary add instruction opcode, uh, in the C Python code, there's a little kind of, um, optimization where it checks if both of the things are ints, and if they are ints, then it does the addition in C as a like sort of speed optimization. So it doesn't actually call underscore underscore add. So how do you fix that? Well, you change the class of two to something other than int. Um, call it int two. So define int two, extends int, has its own add function, so it's not an int, not exactly anyway. Um, and then we go to set it, type error, class assignment only for heap types. But of course, this is something we can get around by manipulating the structures. So here we have a function that sets the type. Um, there's a little bit of, I, I was like sort of unsure about whether I should include like fully functional code that had things that increased references and decreased them for simplicity, remove them. I opted to keep them in, but the important thing here is um, the grabbing of the old type, populating the pi object from the new thing, and then overwriting the ob type. And then um, having a sort of context manager to let us change two to be an int two, and then back to an int afterwards. So here's where we are. With override type two int two, we evaluate two plus two, it's five. So same results we got before. Uh, we define a variable two, and then we override type two to int two and print it, we get a five. But if we do just two plus two, not the variable two plus the variable two, we get four. Why? The final obstacle is something called peephole optimization. Um, it's called a peephole optimization because it sort of looks 
through the abstract syntax tree in little windows and tries to find bits of code that it can fold together or simplify or turn into something faster. So one of the things it does is it looks if there are two literal integers being added together, and if they are, it combines them. So if we use that dis module, and instead of using a variable two like we did the last time, we use a literal two, then we see that in the um, bytecode, it just has a four. And if you were to look at the pi c file, if you were to like analyze a pi c file, you would see a four there. There would be no two and two. So that's why that kind of prevents us from doing what we wanted to do. Um, in C Python, this is performed by the C function pi code optimize. It doesn't occur in an eval, which is why eval 2 plus 2 works, but not when it's defined in a Python function or in an interpreter. So this is the craziest part of the way to get around this, which is to disable Python code optimization with what's called a trampoline function. You basically take the memory where the pi code optimize function is, you overwrite the first few assembly instructions to jump to a new address. That new address is a no-op uh, function that just returns the code unchanged and increments the reference, and you go from here, and success. Um, you run tests, and our test passes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's um, sort of my talk, a uh, quick kind of um, thing because we're allowed to do this. Um, <laughs> uh, we're hiring at the Atlantic. We're looking for DevOps. We're looking for full stack. Um, we're looking for front end developers. Um, we just opened an office in London. Um, James Fallows, if, if you follow the publication, James Fallows has moved to London and he's opening the London office and a few staff writers are moving with him. So I think there will be room for a developer in that office. And then also, obviously, plenty of room in Washington, D.C or with our marketing team in New York. And contact information, and uh, again, that URL for getting the code, which has uh, a lot more detail. Like, I, I sort of showed a simplified version of PyType object. It has like a fully fleshed out, like every attribute matches whatever it is in Python 2 and Python 3, and has the differences between both figured into it. All right, thank you. We've got plenty of time for questions, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We have a microphone for, for recording them. Hi. Uh, can you show us the code uh, which you use to uh, patch the assembly code to introduce the trampoline function? Um, could you, um, maybe I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. So Which you, code? Uh, in the last uh, slide, uh, you, you showed us uh, the one before. Yes. Oh, this. Yes. How did you do this? <laughs> sure. Uh, I can pull that up. Um, what's that? Turn on mirroring here. So, um, in order to paper over the differences between Windows and Linux and Mac, there's like a lot of sort of boilerplate constant stuff here, but the main, the main thing is there's a, there's a function called mProtect. Where it exists is different on Windows and in Linux and uh, Unix and OS X, um, but it, you give it an address in memory and a length and you tell it how you want to you change what that memory does. So by default, the executable memory of Python that gets loaded into memory is not writable but you can use this function to make it writable. So the first thing you do is you figure out 
where the function is and how long you need to set the jump instruction for. And then you make it writable there. So that's the mprotect stuff here. You define your no-op, um, which is to increment the reference because that's what it does in the original C Python code, so it seemed, you know, maybe it's superstitious, but it made sense to do it. Um, and uh, if you're overwriting a function in this way, you can't return pointers to Python objects in the normal way, so I just return the address, which it interprets correctly as a pointer. Um, we have this quaternary func, uh, a function that takes four Python objects and doesn't return anything. That's what the PyCode optimize is. Um, the first one is the code, and then there's like the locals and the frame, et cetera. Um, and then here's the override. So if it's not an x86 architecture, it throws an error because I didn't write it for ARM or any of the other, you know, machine languages. Um, you get the pointer to the old function and to your new patched function. You change, the jump instruction will be five bytes. The first one is the jump bytecode, which is E9. And then the next four is a relative offset to the new address. So you set those five bytes as readable, executable, and writable. Uh, you find the offset between the two. Um, and then this was from me, kind of just testing it. <laughs> um, and then you combine them all together into a list of op codes. Um, you can the multiplication operator with C types lets you create arrays of things. So here we have like a, an, a U, an unsigned byte and multiplied by five will give us an array of five of these things. And then we do from address, we get back an array that has five bytes each for the, the different instructions we're gonna overwrite. And then we just use the slice uh, syntax to replace it. Uh, and then once you do that, that patches it to be a jump instruction of the new function. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for the talk. So it's basically, I have two questions. Uh, what kept you going? Because there's always a certain point where you might say, I can't keep doing that. And how long did that take you? Uh, it actually didn't take all that long. Uh, I was pretty determined. Um, I think one of the, th this, partic this particular bit of code is interesting because this is how a lot of root kits and things work, is that they'll sort of um, set memory writable and then uh, like change actual assembly instructions in memory in order to, you know, exploit some sort of kernel vulnerability or something like that. And so, like, kind of delving into that was interesting in its own right, and so that kind of kept me going along that route, and then once I knew how to do it, then I sort of transferred it to this. Um, so it, was, it, was, it wasn't so much that, like, I was determined to get 2 plus 2 to equal 5, so much as that, like, the things that I had to do in order to accomplish it and the things I had to learn were interesting enough on their own that that kind of kept me going. Hi, thanks for, thanks for the talk. Um, my que question is, um, besides having fun, have you, ever, have you ever had a need to do such stuff in production or no? <laughs> Thank no, you. although uh, there is one case where I have considered using something like this. Um, if you want to change, so going back to that original like attempt to do the, the patching cl patch class where you can just call super to call the original instead of having to do something weird like pass the original function as the first argument, which is what a lot of patching things do, um, that would have been useful for, um, I, I'm, been working on like this uh, sort of combination of pip tools and pip. Pip does this thing where it does a reset hard for any editable repositories. And it'd be really great if I could like hook into that and instead of have it reset and potentially destroy your changes in, you know, a, a, an editable package that's in the SRC folder, 
uh, it prompts you and says, this branch is dirty, this, there are uncommitted changes, do you want to do something with that? As a way to sort of make it easier for our developers to sync up their code with the latest changes uh, on our GitHub. So that was like the one place where it, it's not exactly production, right? Because it would only be run within the span of like a developer updating some uh, requirements on their own development machine, as opposed to say in production where you'd build from scratch or something like that. Um, but you know, a developer wants to save time and just update the one package. Um, so that's where uh, I kind of looked into this. Uh, it never has actually happened, but it's a possibility. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned that the people optimizer runs quite early and that the twos do not even show up in the PyC file. Uh, is it the people optimizer removing these twos or is it some, is it, do you need to disable the people optimizer right at the interpreter start or can you do this on the spot? I'm, I'm confused on when things actually run. When does this optimizer run and what's the reason this four shows up in the PyC and not the two? Is that the same or are those two different passes? Sure. Uh, so the PyC is sort of like a cache of the compiled bytecode. So if the PyC was generated without having run this peephole disable optimization thing, you're gonna, it's not gonna work. Like the, the PyC is gonna trump it. There's like an environment variable you can set to not use the PyC files. Um, but, and, and so actually in the, the run tests, like the sort of um, test runner, uh, I set sys dot don't write byte code equals true, um, just so that you know there aren't any PyC files to sort of mess things up and 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 cause that to to occur. But um, but yeah, so that that's sort of how it connects with the PyC files. Otherwise, if there isn't a PyC file yet when it executes and it's set to write the PyC file, it'll use whatever is in memory. So either the peephole optimizer is enabled or not, and then generate. The, the byte code and save it to disk uh, after that. So hypothetically, if you ran this once and it generated a PyC file that had the twos distinct, then you would, uh, it would stay that way the next time you ran it with PyC files. Hi there, you had a really interesting hackish talk. In the previous file, you had some Microsoft, uh, I know, hate talk, something like that. It's interesting. How, uh, how easy was it to find? Um, a bit higher, no, no, higher up the file, you have some constants, and then you shit talk Microsoft. Oh, these here? Uh, okay, yeah. From the oh, line, though. Yeah, so these. Was that to debug? Where do these come from? Yeah. Yeah, so um, for the, um, the constants for read, write, and execute privileges. Uh, those are in this sys mman.h uh, include file that's on Linux Unix systems. And then um, Microsoft does this thing where they have bit masks. Uh, so, you know, like that, the benefit of bit masks is like you have one and you have two, and then you can and them, and then you have like the byte, the first byte is one, and the second byte is one, and so they're both on. Microsoft does this weird thing with this function where uh, beside, like even though all of the values are offset by one in the list of bits, um, they also have extra properties that combine them instead of just like anding them, which would be the sensible thing to do. Um, but anyway, these I found from like a Microsoft.com, you know, like explanation of how mProtect works on Windows. Okay, because it seemed like horrible to debug in uh in a test environment, this. It actually, like, uh, I followed the spec and it just worked. Um, I mean, because the functions are pretty similar, they're, like, the differences are kind of minuscule, so once I had it working on Linux Unix, then I just had to, like, make a few tweaks to get it to run on Windows. Like, the flags that you pass are slightly different, the order of arguments is different, but in every other respect, it's the same.
Okay. If there are no more questions, just a quick note on the EuroPython app in your mobile. You can just rate the apps, you can add comments, you can thank the speaker, you can add any any feedback you you want, any constructive feedback for for the speaker. So please thank again the uh, Frankie.